Hello history bros, as promised, finally I'm going to evaluate the historical and cultural accuracy of the live-action remake of Mulan. I know I made this promise ages ago, but what can I do? They just kept pushing the release date back. Keep in mind that I'm not a film reviewer, so I'm not going to evaluate this film's artistic merits. I know that there are divided opinions on this film out there. One side says that this film is awful, but let's just agree that the answer lies somewhere in between. And the other side says it's atrocious. Don't say I didn't warn you, but there are going to be lots of spoilers ahead. Let's start by historically dating the setting of the live-action Mulan. The story of Mulan had been passed on throughout ages. There are many versions of it in different forms. Operas, novels, and poems. But the oldest version that we could find was the poem Ballad of Mulan in the collected works of the Music Bureau, which was compiled by Guo Mo Qian in the 12th century. But he said that it was actually derived from an older source from the 6th century, musical records of old and new, which is now lost to history. By looking into the clues of the poem, such as addressing the ruler of the land as Khan instead of emperor, and the directions he traveled to, ancient historians have traditionally dated the setting of Mulan in the poem to the Northern Wei Dynasty, which lasted from 386 to 534 CE, specifically around the time of the Wei Dynasty's war against the Roran in 429 CE. This was also the setting used by the Ming Dynasty playwright Xu Wei for his version of Mulan. He was also the one who first used Hua as Mulan's family name. In the original poem, her family name was not mentioned at all. She was just called Mulan. I have covered this in greater detail in a previous video, and the fact that the character Mulan would most probably be of Xianbei descent instead of Han Chinese. Check it out after the end of this video. So props to the people at Disney for at least doing some basic research. But don't get too comfy yet, Disney. The fire is coming. But first, let's start with something that I like. I like swords. And I like that Mulan is using this single-edged sword here instead of the double-edged jian. Originally, in ancient China, they only used jian. But in the Han Dynasty, because they were fighting against the horse-riding Xiongnu, they had to build up their own cavalry division. And the cavalry used the single-edged sword because it was sturdier. You need a sturdy sword because if you're riding a horse at 50 miles per hour, you are literally adding that much force to your cut. So to easily accommodate for this added stress to their sword, they just made a simple little redesign. They just need to keep the other side unsharpened to provide more support. This design was then used by the cavalry of successive dynasties past Mulan's time. The curved Turco-Mongol saber wasn't invented yet, so this sword would be straight. This was also a sword that her father received from the emperor. So if you know your history, this artistic choice immediately says a lot about her father's military career. It tells us that he was once part of the cavalry, and so will Mulan be if she's going to use that sword at all. It also fits the image of Mulan in the original poem, since her buying a horse and riding it to the battlefield was a prominent part of the poem. What I don't like, however, are the inscriptions on the sword. Brave, loyal, true. Not because I don't like those virtues, but because the way they're written here makes them sound like a cheap tattoo parlor drivel. It is too literal, non-idiomatic, and whoever wrote it have the literacy of a kindergartner. There are exceptions, but the best slogans and concepts in Chinese are almost always written in four characters. And when read together, they mean something. The way it is written on her sword right now makes it sound like it is a shopping list. Loyal, milk, eggs, brave, true, tampon, and so on. I will address a couple more weapons-related issues before I move on. The infantry in the film should have used crossbows instead of bows and arrows. Crossbows were more commonly used by the infantry in China and easier to train in. 
but it was difficult to reload on horseback until they invented the device that lets riders reload it more easily in the Ming Dynasty over a thousand years later. So Mulan being part of the cavalry using bows and arrows is accurate, but the infantry should have used crossbows. In the middle of the movie, there is a trebuchet. It is a counterweight trebuchet, which should not have been invented yet. The earliest account of counterweight trebuchet was found in the Middle East in the 12th century, and this device was brought to China by the Mongols in the 13th century, when they had to take down the Diaoyu fortress. That fortress had successfully defended against the Mongol assault for almost 40 years. But it was finally destroyed when the Mongols brought in Muslim siege engineers from Persia to build the counterweight trebuchet. So in ancient China, the counterweight trebuchet was also known as the Muslim trebuchet. If the Rorans were to have one, they should have used traction trebuchet, which was known in Europe as Manganel. These type of trebuchets was invented by the Mohists during the Chinese Warring States period, around the 4th century BCE. It was operated manually by having lots of people pull on the cord on one side and the lever would throw the stone in the opposite direction. Now, let's move on to Mulan's home. This is a Tulo. It is the traditional home of the Hakka people. Yeah, it looks unique and pretty, but it is overused in movies set in China. It has almost become a trope of its own. Featuring this building again is not an issue, except for the fact that these buildings are located in the southeastern China, predominantly in Fujian, far outside the domain of Northern Wei. And these buildings should not exist yet because they only started to be built around the 11th to 13th century onwards. And it only evolved into this familiar shape much later on. The name Hakka or Kejia people literally means guest people. They are a subset of the Northern Han Chinese who migrated south due to being displaced by wars in a few different waves throughout Chinese history and they developed into this new Hakka identity because they didn't assimilate into the southern Chinese population. The reason why this kind of architecture was developed was because it was intended to be a defensive structure that doubled as a living space for these refugee communities. Since Mulan was most likely of Xianbei descent, she would most probably be living in a tent as a nomad. Okay, let's just say that the Wei dynasty has been expanded. It is much bigger for the purpose of this movie. But if she is living in the south, then it is unlikely that her family would even be called to war. The Northern Wei dynasty was a dynasty that's ruled by the Toba clan of the Xianbei people. And they prefer to use their own horse riders as the main force of their army. Meanwhile, the Han Chinese were usually relegated to less prestigious position in the army and make up the bulk of the infantry. Back then, they used the garrison household system, which is the precursor of the Fuping system that's more commonly used in Western Wei and Tang Dynasty. They would establish and recruit from the specially set garrison household near where their enemies would be. In their case, the northern borders of their domain. Garrison households are families who were usually exempt from taxation but in return, they had to provide soldiers for the empire. Obviously, these hereditary soldier families would be more capable fighters than some random civilians who came from ceramic-making families from the south. If the empire wanted more soldiers, then they would have started by conscripting more from these garrison households before even considering to conscript from other areas because the cost of moving soldiers can become very expensive the further away they are moved from their original home. Soldiers have to eat, you know, and food was never free. So the emperor wouldn't have recruited one man from every household. That is just stupid, and goes against the very system they had created. Now let's move on to the cultural stuff, and this is where the fun really begins. But I will be gentle and ease in by starting with something they didn't mess up. Angry Joe from Angry Movie Reviews noted that he was disappointed that they took out the scene where Mulan cut her hair in the original. But this is actually a good correction. Because men and women in ancient China both have long hair. They just tie them up differently. So there is no point for her cutting her hair. 
it would actually make her look even more conspicuous if she did. Besides, in ancient Confucian China, cutting one's hair or any part of one's body is a sign of great disrespect for one's parents. Your body is your parents' greatest gift to you, so it must never be mutilated. During the early days of the Qing Dynasty, when the Manchu rulers forced the non-Manchu Chinese to shave their hair into queues, there were even people who would choose death before cutting their own hair. Of course, in real practice, people do trim stray hairs here and there, and people shave their hair to become Buddhist monks. But it would be contradictory for her to join the army in her father's place while spitting at his legacy by cutting her hair for no good reason. But they could still salvage this scene. In Xu Wei's play, there is a meta commentary that the role of men and women is mostly based on the clothing they wear and the equipment they carry. Dress for women and armor for men. Disney could have made an equally powerful scene by having her wipe off her makeup, shed her dress, and slowly wear her armor as she transforms into a soldier, a man, before the audience. By the way, there are no rules against women joining the army in ancient China. It is neither encouraged or discouraged because it was just something unimaginable. The reason why a woman had to dress as a man might be more sinister. Back then, they often used convicts to pair up the army's numbers. That is part of the reason why being a soldier was looked down upon. Because they are often associated or assumed to be criminals. Can you imagine how dangerous it would be for a lone woman to be discovered in a camp full of male criminals? Okay, on to the next thing. Phoenix. In Chinese culture, men and emperors are symbolized by dragons and women and empresses are symbolized by phoenix. But phoenix is just a poor and wrong translation of feng huang, and this mistranslation had been stuck for a long time. In the film, they kept using the symbolism of phoenix re-emerging from fire, but that is not what feng huang do. That is the western concept of phoenix which came from Egyptian mythology. Feng huangs don't get reborn from fire, in Chinese mythology, Feng Huang is a symbol of grace and virtue, and it can only be seen in times of peace. So if you see a Feng Huang, it means that the government had done very well, and there is peace throughout the realm. But in Mulan, we keep seeing the phoenix throughout the film, which should not happen because they are fighting a war. Maybe it would make sense if the Feng Huang appeared at the end of the film when peace is brought back to the realm. But at the end of the film, it actually flew away. So what the heck is happening here? Is there going to be a sequel when Mulan massacre half the empire to claim her place as the ultimate empress of China? I don't know. Tell me, Disney. Look, look, look. Let me set one thing straight. Some people out there blamed all this blunder on the fact that all the screenwriters for this film happen to be white. But I really disagree with that idea. If someone's background is the ultimate determining factor, then Brokeback Mountain would have never been so critically acclaimed. Think about it. It is a movie about gay, young, white American cowboys directed by a straight, middle-aged Asian dude that is as far removed from the subject matter as possible. Even Kung Fu Panda, made by an overwhelming crew of non-Asians, is tremendously popular in Asia, including the Sinosphere. If I think non-Asians could never understand Asian history and culture, then I would have never started this channel. The real problem here is that Disney hired a bunch of people who learned all about Chinese culture from cracking open a bag of fortune cookies. It is a disaster of their own making. Oh, and now let me get into the chi magic nonsense. So in this film, Mulan is some sort of superhero born with some chi magic that made her better than anyone without any effort. But in the film's universe, somehow only men can use qi? This is a complete misunderstanding of the traditional understanding of qi in Chinese cosmology. Different sects of Taoism have different understanding of qi, but it is definitely not restricted to male only. It almost sounds like they need a contrivance to present Mulan as a repressed individual, so they just made up a new meaning for qi. 
okay, let me be charitable. Maybe they wanted to copy some wuxia novel, where some individuals are born with greater potential for kung fu. But no matter how special their birth is, they still need to be trained in their chosen discipline or at least learn by experience. There is no such thing as unearned power. That would be a cultural anomaly in a Chinese narrative. Even Sun Wukong from the Journey to the West, who was born out of a magic rock, had to train and learn his skills and powers. In wuxia literature, people who are born special are only given a leg up and can learn faster than average people. They are never born with a gift that makes them super strong without any effort. Nobody would respect that kind of hero. Look, even X-Men from American-made Marvel comic had to be trained. So Mulan here, born with her special chi power, is somehow even better than the freaking Wolverine? Then there is also the bastardization of the wuxia genre. There are actually various subgenres of wuxia. The general wuxia popularized by mega popular titles in Asia, such as the Legend of Condor Heroes, is usually quite historically grounded and set in a specific dynastic period. They can shoot chi blasts, but there is still a veneer of realism, and they use metaphysical justification for their superhuman kung fu feats in an otherwise mundane world. It can be considered as low fantasy. Xianxia, on the other hand, is high fantasy. It involves actual magic, demons, gods, and so on. Through meditation and qi cultivation practices, they can perform magical feats. Classic novels such as Journey to the West and even newer ones like Warriors of Su and The Untamed are examples of xianxia. So they are crossing the streams here with Mulan using her qi powers to be a wuxia hero and the witch used qi to turn herself into a xianxia villain. This is just a complete mess. I also have a major gripe about the overuse of honor by Hollywood and other media in their depiction of ancient Asians, whether it be Chinese, Japanese, or other sort. But it deserves its own video, and it is coming up next. I'm going to explain the real meaning of the values they keep mistranslating as honor, and how Hollywood will never tell a good story if they never clear up this misunderstanding. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss it. Okay, I hope I successfully made a lemonade out of this lemon of a Mulan, and you learned something out of it. Like and share the video if you did. My name is CJ, and I will see you next time. Stay cool, my bros.